It was uh, 1967. Um, my father, who's an artist who lives here in Toronto, uh, with my mother, who's here, who I believe Peter Jennings pointed out, um, made a very strange decision and, and a very fateful one for my brother and I, I think. Uh, we were living in London at the time. We had left uh, Egypt when we were very young, um, Italy, Algeria. Um, and he decided that we should move to an inspired, uh, you know, visionary, um, uh, fantastic place. And that fantastic place was Canada. And he uh, decided to do that as an artist, that what he would do is put my brother and I on a boat instead of on a plane, uh, much to my stomach's dismay. And uh, we ended up uh, seven days at sea making this transition between Europe and Canada. And he kept saying to us the whole time, you're going to the new world. So we didn't know what he was talking about, and we were just little kids. I was nine, my brother was seven. Uh, turned out the new world was Montreal. Uh, Montreal in 67 was pretty amazing. Uh, for two little boys to walk into Expo 67 as the first place they see in the so-called new world uh, was kind of unbelievable. And uh, there was an absolutely fantastic uh, project by Mr. Safdie. Um, that completely shocked us, uh, sh uh, shook me probably forever as, in terms of wanting to become an architect, Buckminster Fuller, um, a number of others, Carlos Scarpa, and so on. Uh, with that in mind, I think my, my brother who spoke here last year, I think, and myself, uh, although we run separate practices and, and work very separately and do different things, uh, I think our quest is to somehow go after that new world and, and really see what, in fact, it entails and how do you build it? How do you, in fact, create inspired, uh, unbelievably awe-inspiring domains and, and situations and cities. A lot that happened between then and now didn't do that. Uh, the very buildings that, that Mr. Safdie cited, um, although part of my undergraduate training, uh, were, were riddled with problems. Um, and I think one of the things that I've seized upon as an architect, and maybe it's time to put my little presentation up there. And if you could just get these lights down so I can see my screen, that would be great. Uh, was the embrace of technology and new technologies. Uh, those were very much alive in 67. Uh, they uh, had their impact in art and culture in a number of areas. Uh, and all of a sudden, 1995, when I was teaching at Columbia University, where I started teaching um, when I was 27, in 95, I um, started a thing called the Paperless Design Studios at Columbia with another professor. And uh, the two of us, uh, in our different ways, decided to look at how technology was in fact changing the landscape, how it changes uh, the world in which we live in, and how do we as architects engage technology. What's that, what that did for my practice, uh, which is not up on the screen for some reason, which is there, uh, called asymptote. Asymptote's a mathematical term. It's the convergence of two lines at the vanishing point, um, or the constant uh, sort of reduction, of uh, exponential reduction uh, towards a, uh, of a hyperbolic curve. Um, Asymptote, which I run with my partner, Lisanne Couture, and, uh, who's also Canadian, in New York, um, is a practice that really tries to, uh, keep, if you could keep those down a little bit, then I'm, or you want to film me, right? Keep it, then you're fine. Be aware of this. <laughs> um, vanity. Um, what, we, what we did is, uh, in 95, when I, I started these research studios at Columbia, which I, in fact, kind of was very influenced by, in fact, not kind of, but, but extremely influenced by MIT Media Lab's research, particularly in data uh, and data uh, mapping, um, I thought, you know, that's something that architects should, in fact, start looking at. Why not look at uh, data scapes, at data environments? Why not begin the, uh, the process of delving into computer systems and digital technologies and see what, in fact, we could come up with? Um, a project that, that spawned for uh, the practice uh, was a project uh, of all people that came to us, which, much to my surprise and dismay, was the New York Stock Exchange. And the New York Stock Exchange said to us, um, we have a situation, excuse me, we have a situation where we're moving $18 trillion worth of capital through our uh, computers and circuitry and, and trading floor, and we need a way in which to uh, basically monitor and map that information and, uh, and understand that information. And we've done four years of research. They had done four years of research with engineering uh, sort of outfits, but we're really getting nowhere. There was no way in which the, the kind of engineering bias could bring them to a situation where they could understand the information and data in which uh, they move through. And so they turned to, they saw the work I was doing at Columbia University and said, could you in fact um, create a data landscape for us, a data environment, uh, and allow us to see our information in some kind of a vivid 
and spatial way. Um, so what we did is we, we basically started as any, uh, in, uh, in a typically kind of architectural process, we, we sort of sketched it out, albeit digital, but we sketched out the, uh, the environment of the stock exchange and abstracted it. What you're looking at here is an abstract wireframe of the trading floor. Um, and the circuitry back here is, in fact, the, uh, all the computer systems that, uh, that run the trading floor. There are two of them in two remote locations for reasons of terrorism and, and uh, security. And they somehow have to be consolidated into this environment or landscape. <clears throat> so what we created was a, uh, a, v a virtual reality, real-time, uh, full-fledged uh, model of the trading floor that they could, in fact, navigate, control, and that they could feed real data into, the, into that environment. It had a circuit board that could be removed. Um, one could bring up these kind of uh, data trays that contain all the computer systems that run the trading floor um, and monitor the, uh, the activity on those, in fact, fly into them and see how they're doing. Um, that data then is, runs out onto the trading floor itself, which is populated by um, sort of virtual, um, virtual sort of stand-ins for the existing trading posts and all the stocks that are traded on them, which are all located in this environment. Um, walls map with uh, information landscapes, uh, all kinds of tickers, television feeds, uh, news feeds, and so on. So the entire environment, in fact, consolidated into a, into a th uh, multi-dimensional uh, spatial uh, entity. The, um, for example, here, <clears throat> between 9 and 9.30 in the morning, when the stocks open, uh, it's important that they understand where any flaws or problems or, or, or troubles might lie. So what you're seeing here is a is a uh, pan through the trading floors opening hours between 9 and 9.30. And that data scape, in fact, is a uh, monitorable, uh, understandable landscape um, uh, containing all the kind of information that they need to see. Excuse me. Um, and of course, because it's virtual reality and pixel real estate, as we call it, uh, one could, in fact, then appropriate or take out pieces of that uh, landscape. Here, for example, are the tra is trading post number two. It has a problem, and there's a kind of a timeline that's being reduced as the problem is being fixed. Um, they can zoom in on that post. Uh, they can see from the kind of flag notation that there's a problem. We developed a notation based on nautical maps. Uh, here they can fly in uh, to a, a proverbially American stock, McDonald's, uh, and see that it's uh, a Dow stock and that, in fact, uh, they can see what it's trading at, what its values are, and so on. Um, they could use all kinds of conventions to understand these both plan uh, conventions and a kind of three-dimensional convention. They can drive the uh, data into, into various screens and watch in real time how the stocks are, in fact, operating and, and, uh, and uh, evolving at any given moment. Uh, we created for them then interfaces uh, to use this because we were dealing with a group of people who had never used three-dimensional uh, interfaces before. These are people who look at 2D data day in and day out, and we had to find a way to um, sort of climatize them and bring them into uh, this, this kind of three-dimensional world which they could, in, in fact, uh, use. The thing that's interesting about it is that it, it basically usurped or kind of uh, made obsolete all of their 2D information. Um, and uh, they found that they could, in fact, consolidate all that into, these, into this kind of three-dimensional world. Um, and the analogy in terms of complexity theory uh, was really that not unlike driving or, or flying, um, that with certain kinds of heads-up displays, three-dimensional activity, uh, and so on and so forth, you have a very, very broad and, and, uh, and uh, impressive uh, comprehension of your, of your territory, and, and the same thing applies to, uh, to data worlds. Um, each piece could be, in fact, extracted. This was a, a key selling point for them when we presented the fact that they could replay the day's events and contain the day's events. In fact, they now record terabytes of information every day with this model. And then go back in, and we simulated the Hong Kong crash for them and showed them a kind of replay, and that's, that's in fact when they sat at the edge of their seats and said, so let's understand this, we can actually replay, and they called it their reality, and they said, in fact, that's, that's the key thing in a, in a virtual datascape or environment is the ability to, to replay uh, a kind of reality. This is a, a container uh, that contain, contains the Dow 30 um, stocks, but it can contain uh, tobacco-related stocks, uh, weather-related stocks, any stocks that can be, uh, in fact, collected into a type can be driven into a, into a data environment like this and then navigated um, according to all kinds of criteria. There you see the, uh, the kind of nautical diagrams that we developed. Uh, the order, that's an order velocity chart that shows, in this case, Caterpillar's activity or uh, Procter & Gamble's activity and so on. And of course, um, 
the, the fact, again, that we're dealing in a kind of a, of a, of a new territory, a virtual reality, a virtual landscape, um, allows for, for all kinds of different things to take place, to implant video feeds, as you have down here, uh, to drag off certain parts of the model, look at them in detail, uh, study, in this case, cues, order velocity, uh, volume of trading, and so on, at, at a micro level. And in many ways, the architecture becomes this, this kind of um, uh, exponential, exponentially reductive and, um, process of looking into reality, into the world of data as it moves through the stock exchange. Uh, these are um, uh, just models of other parts of the exchange. Uh, it was an interesting process as architects. We found ourselves, um, we, we build buildings as well, and I'll show you one or two in a moment. Um, but uh, here we were producing working drawings. We, in fact, had this, um, sent off these drawings to our engineers who were in Tel Aviv and had them take uh, essentially thousands of sheets like this with every single um, aspect of the data of, of our model and its look and feel and, and architecture. Um, and in a way, not a process not unlike architects building buildings, dealing with engineers, consultants, and so on and so forth. This is the trading floor uh, as, as they use it now. Um, we developed the kind of larger interfaces in which they can move around uh, and see all of the data. And these are some other views. Um, another aspect of our practice, which is uh, considerably uh, another part of it, and, and in fact, one of the things I was also going to say about um, really opening and beginning a practice in New York um, was that I, all of a sudden I find myself having kind of multiple personalities. Um, I teach, uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a practicing architect, but I'm also an artist, I guess. Um, we, we find ourselves in, in art venues. Um, and now uh, creating, um, as you just saw, virtual reality environments and a kind of technologist, I guess. Um, in many ways, the computer, and, and I think the computer has become for us the, the kind of moment, the break, let's say, in, in many things. Moment in, a break in perception, breaks in geometry, uh, breaks in uh, the way we perceive ourselves in the world, in the cosmological order of things, let's say. And it may be, and, and this may sound a little bit highfalutin, but it, it may be a break akin to uh, the discovery of perspective in the sense that at that moment in time with the Enlightenment and the printing press, uh, you had a, an unbelievable rupture in the way that people perceive the world um, and perceive themselves and their kind of uh, theological and existential place in the world. Um, for us, the computer has started to, and, it's, and, and I think us meaning generally uh, the human populace, have started to, to reveal things in a, in a very embryonic and, and, um, and initial way, let's say. Um, and so I think we are very much in that, in that initial process. This is a, um, a sketch, uh, it's the way I sketch now and, and work, um, uh, called B-scapes or bodyscapes. It's a sketch based on uh, a premise that the body uh, is in a kind of state of dissolution, is in a state of, uh, uh, there's a kind of break with the, the sense of what body entails within com computer and digital realms. Um, and the body here is mapped through, in this case we use um, athletic gear as a kind of armor and said, well, could the armor, in fact, hold the, the sort of interstitial, spatial uh, cons uh, sort of reality of, of the body in, in, a, in a virtual realm? Could we use that kind of, uh, those kind of tectonics, uh, those kind of mathematical uh, com combinations, and reveal a certain sense of the body in a, in a dissolving or dissolu dissolution, state of dissolution? Um, so what you're looking at here is really just a kind of meditation on on that condition of the body uh, in the late and early 21st century. Um, and um, an experiment that, that I ran with my students at Columbia University in Venice last year at the Venice Biennale, um, and interestingly enough, I was the American representative of the Venice Biennale, um, was a piece we did in the American Pavilion uh, taking a similar strategy and trying to build this kind of dis dissolution moment of the body in a kind of cyberspace or virtual reality um, condition. And what we did is we took uh, technologies used in, um, in, in uh, virtual puppeteering, where you basically monitor all the vertices of the body and, um, and then turn those into virtual puppets, and we kind of inverted that problem and said, what happens if we had a gymnast um, do, a, do a kind of spin or a kind of a cartwheel through the American Pavilion, a, a kind of Dada uh, statement, I guess, and then monitor that, that, that movement and then build that movement back in the space at one-to-one -one as a kind of physical uh, condition. And these were the uh, sketches, the computer-generated sketches that resulted from a gymnast, a very accurate, very, very uh, specific deployment of the body in space, producing a kind of action, violating the space in a, in a kind of, uh, in, a, in a way. 
And um, that then was to add a little surrealism to the data, we uh, handed that over to Venetian boat builders uh, in Venice and asked them to build this uh, structure for us. And so we ended up with a structure like this. Uh, this is the structure in, in the American Pavilion, if you happen to see it. Um, and what it really is is a one-to-one -one mapping of the gymnast's action in the space, physically mapped into the space as a real condition, as a real architecture, as a, as a small building, let's say. Um, when one kind of stood at one end, you could see or, in fact, imagine yourself in the, in embodying the body of the gymnast and what, in fact, takes place as the body moves through the space and, and kind of manifests itself uh, in that way. Um, another, and uh, they told me... Um, another experiment um, in my uh, schizophrenic life uh, as an artist, I guess, was a... Was a um, uh, a Cap Street residency last year in San Francisco, where we decided to build a small piece of architecture, uh, kind of the size here of a car, a large car, and um, attribute the architecture of the piece we built. And if I touch this one, for example, um, it goes through a morphological change. And that, that change is tied into an algorithm, a sound algorithm, which is part of the um, mathematical algorithm that's attributing the action on the, on the surface and as part of the body of this, of this small piece of work. Um, this was really, again, a kind of uh, first, first stab at, initial experiment, very, very uh, 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 sort of first sketch of what it means to create a kind of architecture that's imbued with technology, but more to do with a humanist condition as opposed to an engineering or technologically kind of driven condition. Here the, here the building turns into video noise. That's my favorite one, and so on. And so, um, how are we doing? A couple of museums uh, that we've designed, and I'll go quickly through these. Uh, this is a museum in New York. It's kind of a, um, uh, an antithetical museum to uh, Mr. Gary's museum, which is destined for the site to the right of, of this picture, of, of what our, our thing is. The building looks like a whale uh, kind of beached in Manhattan. Um, uh, the museum, from our point of view, and, and, the, and the notion of building a kind of museum, this was in fact a technology culture museum. Um, and the idea of building a technology culture museum was really to build a physical space uh, that could somehow embody much of the experiments we're doing virtually, um, but also uh, say something about the human condition within these kind of large-scale buildings. And, um, and here you see the building as a kind of a statement that the New York skyline itself is kind of a... Uh, is kind of an emblematic skyline. It's a souvenir of sorts. It's a cliche. And in fact, in some ways, our oppos not opposition, but our contrary approach to Mr. Gary's approach, if you know the Guggenheim that he's intending on building here, is that he's kind of adding to that story, that kind of 20th century legacy of the New York skyline. And we're saying, uh, let's in fact do something, and, and very much in, 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 uh, in taking the words of Mr. Safdie prior, that, that has a kind of invisibility about it. Um, this is the building elevations. The building sits in the harbor of the East River. Uh, it basically kind of alludes to the piers that were once there, but, uh, but is not overtly a, a, a kind of pier. Um, it, it has, it's a large building that is, in fact, a hybrid of, um, of a large scale uh, of these kind of auditoriums and sports stadia that have converting floors that can go from baseball to football to whatever sport, and a convention center. And the hybrid of convention center and, and, um, and kind of uh, sports stadia is really a statement also about the new kind of museum space, that the museum can be this place, uh, if the Guggenheim can in fact legitimately show motorcycles and Armani clothing, uh, why not show ships? Why not show submarines? Why not show uh, incredible, uh, in fact, the, the space between convention center and, 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 and museum starts to very much fall and close. So here you see a section, and the building can actually be flooded. Um, and then, the building has uh, uh, the ability to, and we've been looking seriously into creating um, video skins, video surfaces. NASDAQ uh, wall in, in Manhattan and Times Square actually has a video surface. It's made up of pixels, of bulbs, which can generate extremely high resolution video imagery. imagery. And again, that's a kind of technology-driven condition. And here the idea was, could we in fact create, have the building uh, have almost a kind of skin that is, that is generated by virtue of a kind of abstraction of the city space it's in? And so what you're looking at here is, in fact, uh, the building with that kind of a skin. Uh, here's the interior, uh, not flooded at this moment. It's made up of a kind of vortex, a kind of light well in the middle that's uh, a Namjoon Pike uh, sort of inspired 
um, uh, vortex of video light. So at night, in fact, it's video light that enters the building, and by day, it's uh, daylight that enters through the video light. And there's another view, and it's the last view I'll show. And here, what you see basically is that here's the video kind of vortex, and the city itself is relegated to a museum piece. In fact, for this museum, the largest artifact it contains is the city of Manhattan itself as a kind of a, a, dis in a display window. Thank you very much.